Hi, this is Ken Atchity, and you're listening to Waken Nation with Brad Salas. A huge shift is taking place on planet Earth. People seem to be waking up. Tired of the way things used to be, they are creating something brand new and changing the world we live in. My name is Brad Zalas, and I get to sit down with the next generation of idea makers, the disruptors, and the game changers. Everyday people, just like you and me, from all over, who are doing amazing things. Welcome to Awakened Nation. Hey, everybody. I have a great guest on today, Ken Achity. If you don't know who this guy is, you're about to find out. Uh, producer, author, uh, you name it. Uh, I think you've done it all, Ken. <laughs> well, I'm still finding a few things to do. I'm just, uh, it, the air gets thinner as you climb. <laughs> it is true. Very true. And I have a, I have to give a big shout out to Robert Rivenbark uh, for kind of introducing us. He, he has so many good things to say about you. And um, I'm just jazzed you're on the show today. Thank you for agreeing to do this. Well, thank you. And thanks to Robert. Uh, who is going to be a name that many people will know very shortly as his uh, the cloud makes its way onto screens and publishing. Uh, it's out already as a book, and uh, he's a brilliant writer, a visionary human being, um, and a pleasure to work with. What's really funny about that book, The Cloud, I got a chance to uh, read it, and I'm also going to have him back on because... Uh, he did a book launch and review using AI, artificial intelligence. Um, yeah. But what was incredible about the book is I actually said to him, and I think you may have seen this too, is it, it's not really science fiction. It's almost like, well, what's the logical conclusion over the next 50 years of where we're going to wind up? And I think it's going to make a great uh, movie series. I really enjoy it. Yeah, I do too. I can't wait to see it. So I'm a big fan of the Meg, which you had your hand in. Ladies and gentlemen, Ken Achity, uh, if you've never heard his name, he's an American movie producer, author, columnist, book reviewer, brand consultant, and professional professor of comparative literature. And how many languages do you speak, Ken? Well, speak is uh, not the word I'd choose. I, I'm <laughs> comfortable in, in six or seven languages. The, mostly reading because I was a you know a scholar for years, so I was yeah. doing more reading than speaking. But I can I can find my way to the to the right croissant and you know in French and to the right uh, you know cerveza in Spanish and <laughs> uh, you know a few other European, especially Italian. And I started with Latin and Greek and. Uh, wrote a book that came out a couple of years ago in Jap about J Japanese language, mm -hmm. uh, living with your in-laws. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I've always been a language person. When I was a kid, I, I learned Greek so I could read the Iliad and the Odyssey in Greek. And then I learned Latin so I could read the Aeneid in Latin. And uh, same way with Spanish, so I could read Cervantes and French, so I could read Rabelais and so on. You, yeah, I just obsessed with languages. Yeah, I, I got that impression from your book. And the reason we're having Ken on today, ladies and gentlemen, is really to um, go over his books. You've written many books, but these two that you sent to me, I feel incredibly blessed because it's really, it's your obituary. You decided to take control of your own obituary and say, hey, look, here's my story and I'm sticking to it. I love this one, Daddy Holding Me. And I also have Southern Bell. And what impressed me the most and just blew my mind was your relationship growing up with you and your brother, your father, your mother. You literally just said it. You know, you were kind of obsessed with languages. I love that about you. Um, so let's start there. I really want to hear this story of growing up because you and your brother started your own business in the basement as well. So, yeah, <laughs> when we were much younger, yeah, he was. We started our own little grocery store, which meant we had to raid my mother's uh, cabinets. And she would say, what happened to my, you know, what happened to my baked beans? And sure enough, she would find them on our, our stacks in the basement. Uh, all, all, we had uncles, five uncles who were actually six who were grocers. 
Mm-hmm. And so we all were, we were very familiar with grocery stores. To, to this day, when we travel, my wife and I, first place we go when we get someplace is a grocery store. Um, old habits die hard. You just, you, you love the familiar places in your life. I would agree on that one. Uh, but what I found really interesting is uh, you said this in the book, you're half Lebanese and half Cajun. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So uh, do you speak Creole or as well? Well, my, I, re- I was raised with my mother and my grandmother and all my aunts, my Southern aunts speaking French oh. around us. And, um, and, and that, and it was a source of conflict because my father was very uneasy about that and oh. considered peasant language because the, all of our relatives in Louisiana were farmers and uh, he was raised as a, you know, uh, in a very bourgeois family that believed in shopkeepers and grocery store people. He, he became an accountant, but he, otherwise he would have been a butcher. That was where he was destined until his, he followed his own vision instead of my grandfather's vision. So uh, you weren't allowed to say suck passe in the house. It was mostly, mostly <laughs> comme allez-vous. Uh, no. Your father, uh, he, fo- he spoke, is it Lebanese that you spoke in the house? No, he only spoke English. My, my father was third generation. You know, he was second generation. I mean, his, his father came to this country. So the second generation weren't allowed to speak Arabic at all. They were only allowed to speak English. Oh. Uh, you know, so it wasn't until my generation that anybody was the least bit interested in other languages. But it always struck me as ironic that my Lebanese grandfather also spoke French. Yeah. Um, and, and sang the Marseille, you know, and he, and, and uh, so it was, I just thought it was interesting that both my mother's family and my grandfather spoke French because French was a kind of a second language in, in Lebanon right. after, after Arabic. Hmm. So yeah, I, I was, I, I was surrounded with languages growing up and also conflicts around them. Like my father didn't like to hear French, even though his father spoke it whenever he needed to my mother and he spoke french together and uh like that made my father crazy because he (laughs) he thought he was by bringing her from louisiana to missouri he thought he was rescuing my mother from french (laughs) he was just bringing her right into the you know into the the microphone of my grandfather that's funny yeah yeah my uh, we spoke hungarian um uh, up until I was about six or 10 years of age. And then my grandmother died and my father never spoke it again. It was, it was like he, he was crushed that he lost his mom. So um, I don't remember much, but uh, I have been to a few restaurants and on the way out, I'm going, you always stay the And the, the people there, if they're Hungarian, they're like, Oh, you speak. I go, no, 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 I'm American. <laughs> I just know a little bit. So. Yeah. It's a shame that we lose that because you know, it's a hugely rich part of our heritage. And uh, typically, as immigrants come to this country, they lose interest in their, you know, I once asked my grandfather, have you ever, you know, been back to Lebanon? And he said, no. And I said, are, do you, are you planning to go back at some point? And he goes, honey, why would I do that? And, and I yeah. kind of said it all. It's like he, he immigrated to get away from that, and he's not interested in going back to visit it. I mean, in, in his day, it was uh, the Turks were, you know, it was very much a religious, crazy political thing because the Turks who controlled Lebanon, it was part of the Ottoman Empire when he was born. Right. Uh, they were, uh, you know, they were Muslims and they had very little love for Christians. And my grandfather was a Christian you know, a Christian Arab who spoke French because the French came to Lebanon in the Middle Ages, you know, at the time of the Crusades, and, and and basically ruled over it for centuries. And the best education was in French and so on. But by the time my grandfather came along, it was firmly Muslim, you know, and the right. they were trying to starve out the, you know, the French-speaking uh, Arabs who lived there. And, and my grandfather couldn't wait to leave and 
as he said himself, he had no interest in going back. So, you know, it's when you look at history from a, you know, 20,000 feet, you see all kinds of interesting patterns. When you look at it from ground level, uh, it, it's a lot ruder picture. I mean, it's yeah, I would reality. agree. You know, like uh, what's going on in our country is just horrible to contemplate now because it's there's so much bipolarization polarization that just doesn't need to be there, but it is there because of yeah. current realities. Like we used to be a land of immigrants, now we're trying to keep our borders closed. And right, you know, in the present, there's always a good reason for everything, but it isn't as such a pretty picture when you start, you know, getting too close to it. I agree. Uh, we almost have to say, what? Did, how did this all happen? Because, you know, I've heard stories of my grandfather, my Hungarian grandfather, coming here for the first time, not being able to speak English, pointing at what he wanted on the menu or pointing over, you know, because he couldn't say hamburger, you know, things like that, the struggles yeah. to make a living. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to pick up Ken's books. Um, the first one, it's a, are you doing a third part on this, by the way? Uh, I am, but not in any, not in any hurry because it's okay. probably not Hollywood. So, volume one is my obit, Daddy holding me, and uh, th this I found a fascinating read. Not only being, you know, you're 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 the second, third generation of immigrant parents, but also the rich uh, family history of, you know, you, when you. When you tell the story, you just draw us in because I remember you telling the story in the book about you and your brother playing cards and your mother consistently saying, let your, let your brother win. And that kind of matriculated into the rest of your life. Like you, you, you struggled because you felt good losing because you made your mom happy. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. Cause you were, I remember you had the tennis match with an 86 year old man and you're, should I win or should I make my mom proud? So talk about the, the, the self-sabotage that comes along with this. Yeah. I realized one day on the tennis court, because I, I suddenly realized I had a pattern, which was to get behind and before I felt comfortable and then win from behind. And the trouble with that strategy is that uh, you lose a lot when you do that because, you know, getting behind is just a matter of split seconds in tennis. Right. And uh, so, and I realized I was playing this guy, Hilton, I have played with for years, who was the oldest one in our doubles group. Uh, and I think at the time I wrote that he was 85 or something like that. And uh, r realizing that, Every time I went all out and really tried to beat him, I felt bad. And it was because of my mother. You know, I finally, one day I actually heard her voice in the sky saying, let your brother win. And I realized that's where it was coming from, is that this from childhood thing. My brother had a terrible temper. And when he lost, he threw, a, you know, a tantrum, literally. He threw himself on the floor, screamed and yelled. And it took all kinds of, you know, inducements to get get him quiet. Uh, and I usually went upstairs and tried to study Latin instead of dealing with it all. So, but my mother kept telling me, let your brother win, let your brother win. Like, why is it so important to win when you see what happens when you win? Like, he goes nuts. The whole family's turned upside down. So I was being a good boy when I let my brother win. Uh, and I would even, like shift the cards in my deck when we were playing war that simple game of you know who has the highest card and uh so I, I suddenly realized that as an adult that this was not a good a good not a good strategy i had to give it up uh because you start thinking to yourself well he's 86 years old how how triumphant do i feel if i beat an 86 year old guy right you know, and and i go i you know what would it cost me to to just let him win uh, and well, what it costs you is your ability to play the game, because if you're not playing to win, then wh why are you playing? Um, and that was very insightful moment in my life. And uh, and I still struggle with understanding the whole thing, because my brother was totally focused on money. And I was totally focused on anything that was not money, like, you know, writing a poem, right. writing a short story published, editing, a you know, a newspaper. Um, and 
you know, or writing an 850 page thesis, you know, at Yale where I was in graduate mm -hmm. school. Uh, and every time a movie of mine came out, we'd have a drink afterwards and he'd say, how much did you get for it? It's his only question. Yeah. You know, it would be how much, how much did you make on it? And uh, I would sometimes I try to explain it to him. Hollywood is not easy to explain, but he he never got it, never understood it. And uh, and I realized that, you know, that that was foundational on how it, the things that happen when you're a kid are foundational. I mean, they you, sometimes that can outgrow them, but you can only do it by being aware. And yeah. uh, awareness was my my middle name, you know, all the way through my life, I've been painfully aware of what's going on uh, at any given time. And I thought, uh, you know, the ultimate, if you're in the world of stories, like I am, my nickname is the story merchant, um, what you're always up against is the fact that, you know, stories are commodities in life and that because they're yeah. strategies too, they're tools that we use to preserve our momentum. And uh, they justify our actions to ourselves. And the ultimate story is, is the obituary that appears, you know, in the newspaper or wherever. And it's usually yeah. written by a complete stranger who doesn't know the person. And yeah. uh, it started to tick me off as I got older. I go, you know, I need to write my own story. This is what I spent my life doing, telling stories and selling stories. So that's why I, I decided to write these books. And it's interesting, the reaction I've had from the family, I thought it was going to be, uh, you know, a huge wave of negativity because I have so many cousins and so on. Right. But I have to say, it's it's been the opposite. Uh, that's that's fantastic. Heard, yeah, almost everyone I've heard from has thanked me for doing it. Uh, you know, one, one cousin I probably only talked to three times in my life before that. He wrote me a very tearful letter about how much she appreciated my making my feelings for her father clear. And uh, she said, this is the best tribute to him I ever read or heard of. And uh, that made me feel good just to think that my story touched her that way. Um, so, yeah, that's why I did it. Well, I, I'm thoroughly enjoying uh, both your books because – it really brings about a type of nostalgia we don't see enough today. I think the last time we saw this was uh, the TV show, The Wonder Years, or uh, a Christmas, the, the Christmas Story, where yep. we go back and we narrate and we look at our lives as an adult now and what those events did to drive us to be successful or not successful or you know whatever, or to be the curmudgeon like your brother can be, but that those little tiny people that showed up as very important actors in the script of your life, uh, your uncles, you know, you wrote about uh, them as well and your mom, your everything. I mean, it was, uh, it's just so well-written. First of all, uh, your sense of humor comes through. I also love that you sort of do it like the Odyssey, you know, you're leaving the Island of Cy the Cyclops and the, the, just the way you, you presented it. It's, it's an easy read. It's a fun read. And ladies and gentlemen, if you like memoirs or, or stories about family, uh, you're going to love this. I, I think it should be made into a movie. It's probably, it could be a Hallmark uh, kind of movie as well, you know, with the, uh, the happy ending of you and your brother uh, coming together. Um, but you, you and your brother, Freddie, you, you knew how he was, but you guys started a business together. And let's talk about that a little bit. That was that was kind of like oil and water, but you you kind of figured out later he is a master salesman. Oh yeah, there is no question he knew what he was doing. And I'll I'll never forget a time when we were actually in business together, and we were going to make a video uh, that we needed a, a blonde for uh, as the as the speaker, you know, in the video. And right. this, this woman which came to our meeting at my office, his office was next door at the time, and he wanted to come to the meeting. She was a beautiful blonde, let's put it that way. And she came that we, without our expecting it, she came with her husband, uh, who was her manager. And uh, 
she started talking about, uh, you know, why she was perfect to do this. And he said, sorry, can I interrupt for a minute? This is like three minutes into her pitch. And, and he said, uh, she, she said, sure. And she stopped and he said, just looked her straight in the eye and he said, you know, blondes like you are a dime a dozen. And she said, excuse me? And I can see her husband's face turn red. He goes, yeah, I mean, this is Los Angeles. There's 10,000 blondes are getting off the plane every day. And uh, why should we hire you when there's all these other, you know, thousands? <laughs> and they were so furious. And I was going, I cannot believe that he did this. And, he, you know, I can't believe I let him do this, that I let him come to this meeting and him doing his usual bullshit, blah, 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 I'm thinking to myself. And uh, long story short, we didn't hire her at the end because he refused to, you know, he says, look, what, what's your bottom line? What, 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 you know, what would you do it for? And they gave us a number that was ridiculously high for us and blah, blah, blah. And she leaves and he goes, um, he turns to me and he goes, how'd I do? And I go, how'd you do? Like you, you fucking blew them out of the, you know, out of the ballpark here. You, right. you, 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 you killed, you killed it. Any relationship. He says, yeah. And how much time do you think we saved because of that? You know, we could have sat there with them for hours. Uh, and I said, I just wanted to get to the bottom line. I think I did good. You know, he said, and I realized there's just no universe in which the two of us were compatible in style of dealing with people. And uh, that's the way he was. He was, you know, he, he broke all kinds of rules in order to get to the bottom line. And that's because he was focused on the bottom line. And uh, he wasn't focused on communication. He was on getting what he needed to go to the next step. Uh, we had a lot of, you know, experiences like that. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you know, we, we ended up back in business together in his last couple of years. He passed on about five years ago, and we were working on a movie at the time, which I'll still continue with until I get it done for him. But, uh, yeah, there was this desire for us to do things together. My mother egged us on all the time. You guys should be working together. You're so perfectly compatible, but not really. I mean, it went, for me to be compatible with him, I had to be in the losing position. <laughs> and it took me until two years before he passed to stand up to him and point out that I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, and he actually started behaving perfectly after that. Uh, oh. Once he was sure that I was serious about it, he stopped you know, bugging me all the time and he stopped his bullying behavior yeah. and we got, we actually got close for the first real time in our lives. Isn't that amazing when that happens? Sometimes it's a, that simple event that makes uh, everything turn around where you, you finally have had enough. Yeah. yeah. That's, That's what funny. it was. I, I just had enough and I told him, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I don't want, any more emails from you. I don't want any texts. I don't want to hear from you. You know, I, I, I will not take this anymore. And so two peaceful weeks went by and then I suddenly got this call from him saying that very humble, you know, message that he had gone to church and prayed to St. Jude and St. Jude told him, be nice to your brother. And, I, and he said, and I decided he was right. So please call me and let's talk about it. So I finally called him and it was, it, he was very, very sweet. And, you know, we actually talked like brothers as opposed to rival knights on a, on my mother's playing field. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was, it's funny because the same stories keep cycling through your brain, no matter how old you are. And one of the challenges of writing uh, an autobiography like this is that your your points of view are always different depending on whether you're in the present talking about the past or whether you're in the time that something happened thinking about it. So one of the challenges of writing a biography is figuring out how to show the reader what your point of view is at any given time. 
so the yeah. reader can track the progress. It's not, it's not, it's complicated to do it, but it was eye-opening too. Yeah. I want to ask you how, you know, because when you read the book, you, you're highly educated, you love languages, you, you're literarily obsessed, you know, you like to read, you like to know, you like to do the research from Yale to did you go to Georgetown at all? Um, yeah, Georgetown is where I went to college. So here you are on the East Coast. How did you get to Hollywood? What what transpired to get you there? Well, it was a, a number of steps. I mean, the first step was when I left Yale, I had uh, lots of job you know, offers. Uh, it was kind of embarrassing. In my class at Yale, there were 14 of us, and I got 12 job offers and the others, nobody, nobody got any job offers among the others. It's horrible. Uh, that was embarrassing. And, but I also, by that time, had two kids who were very young, my son and daughter. And, and uh, I wanted to, I chose the place that it would be a good place, I thought, to raise them, which was California. And uh, partly because I was sick and tired of winter after, you know, mm. three years in New Haven. Yeah, uh, where the sun disappeared in September and you saw it again in May if you were lucky. Yeah, I know. Uh, Been there. Yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, I chose LA because LA to me was like Louisiana. It was had most beautiful flowers in the world and beautiful flora and fauna. Um, and I uh, came out here as and, and started being a professor, and I did that for, I think, 17 years before uh, I suddenly, you know, when you're in L.A., you start noticing the film business as a business as opposed to just things to watch, you know, in the screen. And uh, at one point I got interested in, since I was focused on storytelling, I got interested in uh every kind of storytelling outlet from publishing to television and film. And uh, I, I came up with an idea for a set of films. And uh, to my amazement and through the most painful year of my life, I s actually sold them to a studio, uh, the studio that's now Warner Brothers, and uh, ended up heading off to Canada to make what started out as four films, but ended up being 16 films. Wow. Uh, and uh, in, a, in a series, uh, a romantic series about uh, various kinds of contemporary relationships. Uh, it's called Shades of Love, and the titles were things like The Tangerine Taxi, Make Mine Chartreuse, The Rose Cafe, uh, Lilac Dreams, uh, and, and the emerald here, and uh, that, that's how I made the transition. Is from that. Once I started doing that, I didn't go back to being a professor. I had to make a decision because yeah. I was on leave of absence, and I didn't want to didn't want to go back and be a professor when I was doing actually getting movies made and into a, you know onto the screens. It was more exciting than just analyzing them and criticizing them and you know, helping people uh, with their stories. So right. we still do that. We, we help people get their stories done, but the excitement is to actually get them to where wider audiences can see them. Right. I remember when I, I wrote one of my scholarly books. I think I wrote six or seven scholarly books. Uh, I discovered at one point that it had sold 64, 64 copies worldwide. And, and I started... I could just see my mother saying, honey, you can do better than that. You know, <laughs> and, you know, it was most of my stuff was inaccessible to ordinary mortals. Um, it was things like narrative strategies in, in the Quixote and, uh, you know, the, some, the appearance of the uh, Bombador in the Fairy Queen and, you know, these typical scholarly stories and I, I still love all that stuff but i just you know i figured I, I can reach more than you know 12 people it's not and not enough and so i changed changed careers entirely and ever since then uh i was going from being 
having the most secure job in the world, a tenured professorship, into the least secure job in the world, being a you know independent producer and literary manager, which is what I've been doing for the last thirty-five years. Well, it, it's like um, I think it kicked in your sense of adventure. You know, I mean that for lack of a better word, you know, because now you can, instead of lecturing, you can really tell bigger stories to a wider audience, as you said. And I think there's something exciting about that um, for any writer, I, I feel. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely exciting because you there's a satisfaction co that comes from any plane I get on, you know, any town that I'm in. I see posters for the MIG everywhere. I hear from people in China about the poster in their square. And uh, it, it's just, you feel at least you, you were able to reach out and touch a little piece of the world. There's yeah. a nice satisfaction to that. Um, I feel massively inadequate. I used to, it was kind of a big fish in a small pond when I was a professor. And now I'm a tiny fish and, you know, the biggest pond of all in Hollywood. Um, so I have great aspirations still. And, uh, you know, there's just no, there's a limit to academic aspirations. Yeah. Uh, unless you have to be that rare, you know, Stephen Hawking's type genius that is so fully obsessed with what he's thinking about that, uh, you know, he has no choice but to stay doing what he's doing that's the nobel prize people and then yeah. you know not in that category but i've been much more like a dilettante truly a dilettante castiglione's the courtier which they studied at yale is, is about the classic renaissance dilettante who loves everything so much that he does 10 different things and yeah maybe he's not he never reaches the nobel status but he's enjoying every minute of his life and doing new things all the time and feeling like an imposter all the time uh, because he's never done this before. So, I mean, I have a long, long list of things that I hadn't done before I did them. And that's been exciting all my life. And, hmm. you know, I've always tried the impossible and sometimes it gets done. Sometimes it, it isn't done yet. It reminds me of Somerset Maughan's um, The Razor's Edge. Uh, you know, where Larry goes all over the world in pursuit of whatever this thing is and has such enriching experiences. Uh, that's what you remind me of. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot, you know, a lot to be said for that. And, uh, you know, I, it, 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 to me, what's, what you're doing at the moment is the most exciting thing. Mm -hmm. And it's funny when you look at something as old as the Meg, because I, I first was involved with that 26 years ago, and oh, uh, wow. I, was, I I developed it. I sold it for millions of dollars. I sold it to two studios. You know, had ended up make helping Steve, the writer, uh, end up with I think 11 bestsellers, New York Times bestsellers, and uh, now working on another movie with him. And it's but it's always the one that you know, you're in the middle of, it's the most exciting. And yeah. the ones that happened before, like they're, they feel irrelevant to you. Yeah. You know, they, they just feel like that, that's not what I care about. What I care about is the one we're working on right now. We just signed a director to, you know, his latest movie. And uh, that's what's exciting me. And, uh, you know, it gets done and then it, it's part of, it, it becomes its own historical personage, you know, like a, you get yeah. something going, whether it's a book or a film, and now it has its own life, its own history. Uh, and doing it in the time of the Internet makes it even more exciting because you can see the Wikipedia pages grow as you move through time and projects. I mean, I've been involved in hundreds of projects. Yeah. And I love to see traces of their reality, whether it's a poster or whether it's a, you know, a 90 foot high uh, teaser. Uh, in, a, in a mall somewhere. Yeah. So yeah, it's been exciting for sure. For those of you who don't know, uh, Ken has produced uh, 30 plus films, including Hysteria with Maggie Gyllenhaal, The Expatriate with Aaron Eckhart, The Lost Valentine with Betty White, Gospel Hill with Danny Glover, 
Joe Somebody with Tim Allen. That was a good movie. I enjoyed that. Uh, Life or Something Like It with Angelina Jolie. The Amityville Horror. The Evil Escapes. Shadow of Obsession with Veronica Hamill. The Madam's Family, Ellen Burstyn. And The Meg with Jason Statham. Uh, I really enjoy. You know, when I, I saw The Meg poster, I thought to myself, I, it was writing at that time the these really bad horror movies that were coming out of uh, sharknado and things like this and i kept thinking oh i wonder if this is any good and i went to that movie and sat in the theater and i loved the meg i just couldn't i was blown away so thank you for bringing that to the light because um it's just a great story and it was well done um uh interculturally uh you can see the the asian influence as well as uh you know the western influence the science the the possibilities of this thing being real i mean i loved it i had a lot of fun watching it i've watched it many times so thank you yeah i was thrilled to be able to to do uh to redo jonah and the whale i mean that's what it really is yeah you know, it's, and, and there's a whole there's a whole slew of those stories uh including the old man in the sea one of my favorites by hemingway yeah it's something fascinating about the whole idea of a fish, <clears throat> you know, against a man, a man against a fish. And it's basically heroic. You know, it's simple in concept. And uh, so when I was helping Steve shape it, we were very conscious of, you know, the mythic basis of it all. And, uh, you know, and of course, Jaws, which we were well aware of all the way through and what yeah. could be. What could be more scary than a, than a guy against a, a white shark? Well, a guy against a hum, humongous white shark, you know. <laughs> and uh, I, I see when I'm reading through Instagram and, you know, Twitter, th the fans reacting to whether the movie is better than the book and all of that. And I, I love that idea that people are so fascinated that they they criticize the movie because they change the one of the characters or because this happened instead of that happened and to, to me it's just a sign of engagement and you know totally. intensity i agree with you on that one um uh, my favorite author is frank herbert who wrote dune but i've watched closely every time dune has been made and remade and uh the fans and everything like that and uh it's just exciting to to see something that wonderful that that universe that world come to life on the silver yeah. screen as they say what what film are you most proud of don't you think by the way that the latest dune is is the best i mean i i think that they yeah. brought life finally yeah i think they captured it uh frank herbert's writing is incredibly complex but at the same time he wastes not a single word like i've i've read dune six times the first book and over and over again, I, I marvel, you know, I'm a writer as well. I marvel at the lack of waste in every sentence, every paragraph. There is no meandering. Everything connects. And I'm just like, how do you, how do, you do that? Because I, I go over and over and over again sometimes um, that editing of the book, you know, or editing of what I'm writing. Uh, and it's really wonderful to see. Yeah, I agree. And it's, it's, uh, it it's what gives the his language the air of authority because there is no hesitation there's no search for words everything is is low written on, in stone right um, and i i love to read dune to an audience yeah. and i used to teach speculative fiction just so i could teach dune well the the kid that they chose to play paul moy deeb i think he captured uh paul more than any other actor because paul was tiny you know that, that's something that doesn't come out a lot of times and so all the other actors that have played him have been these very macho sort of you know stand tall guys and here is this guy who captures the essence you know he's basically a spoiled whiny teenager at the beginning and right. he's small and that's why he chose to be named after the desert mouse this tiny this yeah. tiny animal and so he grows into a warrior that leads you know, an army. And I think you're right. I think this is the best Dune. I think they captured it. I can't wait till the part two in November. Um, yeah, I'm a, a definitely yeah. a, Her a Herbert file. <laughs> exactly. 
Yeah. Uh, love that kind of stuff. Love science fiction. Um, let's talk about Robert's uh, book, Cloud, Robert Rivenbark. I felt when I read it, I was really on the edge of my seat because I've had the experience of, um, uh, I'm known as a generational business person and you know I've done a lot of creative things in my life, but science fiction is something I almost uh, obsess over and I see how we're, where we're going. And so when I watch shows like The Peripheral and uh, Blade Runner and things like that, I'm really sitting there going, will the human race evolve to this? And I felt like Robert's book, The Cloud, really is the evolution of humanity when we when we get to this point where the the technology is being used to separate society from the rich and the oligarchs, the kafalit, as he says in the book, and then the the sort of the peasants who are playing in this VR AI driven world. Uh, and I'm glad, by the way, you picked it up and you're going to be working with him on that. Yeah, no, he's he's giving us a, a scary vision of where we're heading, and it, it couldn't come out at a better time that all this consciousness of AI is. Uh, pervasive because it's so much to do with AI and, and our typical, typically human failure to do anything to control it until it's too late. And uh, that's the world we'll get if we don't control it somehow. Yeah. And, and it may not be controllable. It may be the past the point where it could have been controlled. It's very similar to the, you know, to the atom bomb because, you know, was there a moment when we could have not done it? Uh, there are lots of arguments that if we didn't do it, somebody else was doing it and blah, blah, blah. But, but the, the weird thing of it is that, that one was that one was more controllable than AI because AI is being invented by dozens and dozens of people in very in se separate places and there's no connection between them and uh, nobody's controlling any of them. Right. So we we are evolving. I mean, it's a tangible thing where you can reach out and feel evolution because it's affecting us every day already. Uh, every time we see another ad on the internet, that why are they sending me ads about you know arthritis medicine? You know, how do they know that you know I've got arthritis? Uh, and you watch TV at night and you're starting to suspect. Even your the commercials you're seeing on TV, like how how do they know this and that? And we've been living in that situation for 15 years at least. Um, and when it comes to things like, uh, you know, one science fiction magazine had to shut down last year because it was being swamped by art of AI short stories that were being sent. You know, it, it was having let's say. 500 submissions a month and then suddenly within a year that went up to over a thousand and and the other ones that were ai and it's not that they can't tell the difference between the two it's they don't have time to process them all right so they had to shut down because they were being swamped by this and not to mention the problem that it causes in in school you know where a teacher has to figure out whether you know, whether this submission from a student is AI or real, and they have all these things they have to, you know, <clears throat> touchstones they have to go by to how do you figure it out? And they have, they even have AI programs to help them figure out which is AI and which is not AI. So we, we've, uh, you know, we have got to get some kind of handle on this whole thing. Yeah. Because and this is what the Writers Guild strike is, is partly about right now, which is that writers, you know, are really not that necessary in, in the opinion of some studios. You know, for example, if you own the franchise for Charlie Brown and you look at next year's budget for writing, you know, 14 new scripts to, to continue it on TV, you actually could have an AI device write those 14 scripts uh, for a fraction of the cost. And uh, in about 10 minutes, I yep. mean, 10 minutes for all 14 scripts. And, and, and the, the audience of kids at home watching it, they, they can't tell the difference. Yep. And, you know, they, because they have massagers, you know, who take the result from the AI machine 
and then go in and tell it how to correct itself so it's more, you know, more human. Right. Uh, and, and that's what happens to all the writers who are employed in all of that. What happened to the concept of human originality? Um, it, do we, and the, more importantly, do we care? Right. You know, because a lot of people don't care. They don't have time to care because they're too busy. It is an interesting paradox that we are entering into right now because a lot of the functions, you know, I've been a creative director and a graphic designer and a, and a writer and for years. And to think that that could be duplicated by a robot, basically, you know, uh, kind of is scary. You know, even if you are going to work with the tools and, uh, you know, hey, I did this painting in 10 minutes, you know, I mean, it's uh, what's going to happen to the human race when artificial intelligence and machines can take over those basic jobs that a lot of people uh, thrive on just to be able to eat. And it's coming yeah. very quickly. It's happening right now. Um, I was fascinated with the strike when I heard this. Um, this should just make everybody angry, but basically Netflix, I believe it was, they have been, uh, people have been streaming over a billion hours of the TV show Suits and billion hours okay and people don't realize the writers only got three grand for that like each for for the most popular show on netflix uh, you know and that's wrong you know i mean imagine going to work folks and suddenly you know someone's getting rich off of what you're producing and you're getting paid nothing um, and that's what's been happening uh, lately. So the strike is necessary. Yeah, it's necessary. I just don't know if if they if if it's too late to define things enough to to resolve anything. That's the yeah. problem. It's it's a, a basically a big hairy mess. But you said what will happen to the human race if this continues? Well, the answer is it will evolve, and. Yeah. We are in the midst of a very powerful evolutionary moment because it will be a new world. Humans will have to be uh, finding a new way to be human, basically. They'll find, I mean, I find myself intrigued on I, in, in Instagram when I see uh, this Robert Rivenbark, you know, Rivenbark who built the a little reviewer that looks like an alien, either female or male, and they appear on Instagram and they tell you something about the cloud. And yeah. I'm, I'm intrigued by that. I mean, really intrigued by it. I, it. It's like I am intrigued by a AI creature reviewing a human book. And, and I, by the very fact that my brain is intrigued, <laughs> it tells me that there's, we, we've passed the point of no return. We are yeah. in the midst of evolution. We, we are going to deal with it. We have to deal with it. Um, and it's, it's maybe we can use it to help understand the complications of that it's, that it's creating for us. But um, there's no question it's going to be a major, major part of the next 10 years. Yeah. Wasn't it Thomas Freeman who wrote, uh, he wrote a couple of books on how are we going to handle this new world, you know, emotionally. Some countries such as India and China, he said, uh, we're going to skip the industrial revolution immediately and go straight into the computer age. Well, how do you emotionally as a group of people handle that? And what came out of that is now you have young women in India in the major cities going off to getting jobs for the first time independently while that never happened before generations you know you got married you stayed at home until you got married and now this independence is happening and you'll find um you'll be in the market square where you smell camel dung and you can go into a tent and access your email you know so he, he, these contradictions were going to start to take place and he pointed this out and that's exactly where we are right now. We're seeing it in everything from the fact that younger generations don't want to work that hard um, because they don't have to. They have computers and they know how to use the technology. And now people get more comfortable working from home because the technology allows us to do this. All of a sudden, this is what we're looking at. We're looking at a world of dichotomy. You know, I'm a, I'm a baby boomer and I was always taught hard work, showing up, 
you know, your, your, your ass in the seat <laughs> uh, was work and work hard. And, and, and then you play hard. Well, now we're in this very strange world where you don't have to put that much time and effort into something in order to really get the feedback from it or, or the financial gain. You know, we're in the age of um, Instagram influencers. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's exciting to be part of it. It's also exhausting because, you know, <laughs> we're killing ourselves with our own media. Um, yeah. And when you look at, at, at the national media, you know, the television news, for example, they have a completely inordinate impact on what's going on in history because they demand they demand uh, sooner trials, open trials. They they never stop talking about the thing. And, uh, you know, in the old days, events happened. We got reports of them, but we are now immersed in reporting. And, and a lot of the reporting is not based on reality. It's based on the opinions of journalists yeah. uh, who agitate for things like open trials and, you know, where everybody gets to see everything, who agitate for things they don't fully understand. Uh, they're not basing it on laws. They're basing it on opinion and what will sell more ads yeah. and all that. So it's just a very complicated world. Okay caused by our inability to stop telling stories. Well, it's um, if you look online, it, this is a great um, commentary on this, but I, I believe it's entitled Huxley versus Orwell. Hmm. And I, I, you know, the, the author basically says, uh, I think we're getting a little bit of both. We're going to be entertaining ourselves to death while, you know, the, the you'll be stomped uh, with regulations and boots on the ground. So both are happening at the exact same time. Um, I have a, you know, you know, the, there's an ancient uh, Chinese uh, saying, which is, may you live in interesting times, Yeah, which is, which is actually a curse, by the way. It's not yeah, a nice right. thing. Um, where they, they, they just kind of put out there that, you know, hey, I hope you live in times where it wasn't so great. I think what is going to come out of all this chaos, and I think we have another... 20 years of pure chaos um, before we figure this thing out as a society. Um, how will we live in a global world? How will we um, be able to embrace, you know, they're, they're pushing these 15 minute cities. They're pushing for us to be in um, electronic cars. They're pushing for all kinds of things. Where is the human race going to be in the next 20 years? Uh, and, and I'll ask you that. Where do you think we're going to be in the next 20 years? flying cars uh, <laughs> we're supposedly five years away from you know the first flying cars and uh, where are we going to be we're going to be in interesting times that's for sure and uh, <laughs> and sometimes you just need to turn turn the dang thing off and go away and i hope we we never lose our uh, you know ability to do that to just go off to the woods and the seashore and forget all of it because there's a much bigger world out there than we're creating in front of ourselves. And uh, I hope that bigger world survives. Uh, yeah. That's one thing we're going to have to, you know, we either deal with it or it's not going to survive. And, and, and the space program isn't advancing fast enough to, to let us segue immediately to another planet. Um, Ain't that the truth? And, and, you know, given our propensities, I, I dread, what would happen if we did segue to another planet? Because what is the point of going off to another planet and ruining it the way we've done with this one? Uh, yeah, you, know, you said it. <laughs> from a historical point of view is that it takes, it takes the Earth a long time to do things, but it gets them done. It might take a, another million years to get rid of signs of human, you know, human presence. Yeah. Um, but it will, and it it can, and that's that's going to be our ultimate punishment: is to eradicate ourselves and have the Earth create something else. And you know that's what fascinates me about people who are investigating archaeology um, that shows that there were actually humans having civilizations twenty five thousand years ago, not yeah. not just five thousand years ago, but much earlier. And we're just now discovering 
you know, what they might have been all about. Right. And some of the wisdom that we don't have is, is coming to us that way. So it's easy for me to imagine that our civilization may be one of those places that only two million years from now will, will humans in the future discover and, and learn what we did wrong to screw up everything. Uh, by which time, hopefully, the earth will have healed itself. And, you know, it's fascinating. You know, when you think about all this kind of talk and you realize that we're just this one out of multi-billion planets out yeah. there, it really makes you wonder what the universe is about. Like, what is the purpose of having all this intelligence in one little dinky planet in a dinky solar system? Um, what has it got to do with, you know, consciousness it's yeah. fascinating it one is. of my sci-fi writers is kurt vonnegut yeah and at the beginning of one of his books sirens of titan he says uh every every 40 seconds the solar system moves sixty-five thousand miles closer to the constellation Betelgeuse. and yet some people wonder if there's such a thing as progress <laughs> you know you, that's that's his sense of humor too by the way yeah i know and uh, but it makes you it just makes you realize how we create all this stuff in our heads and it affects our our, our stress and our brains and our whole bodies and, and the future of our race and we're just this tiny little planet in the middle of nowhere and uh you know it makes you wonder how many tiny little planets have that kind of craziness going on that we do um, is that nat- is that the nature of life just to complicate things and I don't know plenty to think about and uh, and it's exhausting too it, it finally, it is. at the end of the day it wears you out and maybe there's a lesson there too I don't know that's powerful but, yeah. well, I, I think when um, all countries come to an alignment I'm a big Star Trek fan Um uh, a friend of mine said it best years ago. He says, I love Star Wars, but I'd rather live in the Star Trek universe. <laughs> and I agree because what would happen if the planet Earth was threatened in some way and we all had to put aside our our prejudices and everything else and just had to buckle up and say, you know what? We're the human race and we need to stand with each other, period. And um, I hope that that day comes soon. Yeah, I do too. That's great vision. Great vision. Uh, how do people get a hold of you, Ken? Uh, where do they reach out, or you know? Uh, well, the best way is StoryMerchant.com. Uh, it's my main company, and it explains what, like what we what we do, how to reach us, what uh, yeah. what it's all about. Um, yeah, and uh, you launched something uh, that I love, and uh, write your own obituary. <laughs> Uh, yeah. which, which I think is, uh, who better than to write your own uh, obituary? Um, I wrote my mother's obituary and delivered it. And I got to tell you, it's one of the greatest feelings. Um, so, uh, reach out to Ken, please. And, uh, we're going to do a lightning round real quick. Uh, did you want to say something? I hope everybody comes around to writing their own story because it's the best way to learn what your own story is, is to try to write it. Yeah. Uh, and I love helping people do that. And uh, we're never going to be tired of stories. And, and you need to, you know, if you had unusual things happen in your life, you kind of owe it to not only yourself, but to the universe, meaning us, to tell us that story. Because you never know what little thing in your story changes somebody else's life. Uh, and that's what's most satisfying about it is when you hear somebody, you know, I started thinking about myself totally differently after reading this book and blah, blah, blah. That, that means it was meant to be, and you owe yeah. it to us to write it. It's so true. All right. I'm going to ask you three questions in our lightning round. Hopefully we'll get a chance to know you a little bit better. But the first question I have is how did you meet your wife? Uh, I met her at a party uh, for, from a CBS executive that she was married to at the time. And uh, we became friends for years uh, until she broke up with him and I had already broken up with the person I was with. 
and then uh, we stayed friends for years. But then one of this, you know, when we were both free, it it fell together perfectly. Yeah, that's fantastic. And and uh, your book, uh, Living with Your In Laws, was inspired by uh, having your in your in laws live with you. Am I correct? Yeah, exactly. They they spent much of each year with us, and we traveled together all over the world and uh, got to be very fond of them, even though, you know, they spoke Japanese and I spoke very little Japanese. (laughs) That's That's a fantastic story. Uh, My second question is, do you really feel that you had some closure uh, with your brother in those final years? I do. I mean, that's something I'm very grateful for because we were basically at each other's throats for most of our lives, um, caused by the the constant agitation of either my father or my mother uh, when we were young. But I, at the end, you know, he call he would call me and just have nothing in business to say. It was just to chat, and that never happened before, and it was mm. hugely satisfying. And and I realized in retrospect that it was all because I played the wrong role. Uh, submitting to my mother from you know the the youngest point, yeah. I was playing the wrong role. I was the older brother, and I needed to pay, play that role, and he needed it as bad as I did. So yeah, it was very satisfying. I think for both of us. I love that. And I guess my last question is: out of everything you've accomplished, out of everything you've done, is there something that you're the most proud of that you've accomplished? Well, uh, oddly enough, I think what, you know, I'm pro- most proud of the fact that I survived, <laughs> that I, you know, as Faulkner <laughs> says in The Sound of the Fury, I endured uh, and, and was able to make it through uh, many more dark nights of the soul than I could have imagined I could make it through and keep going and, and just learning more about everything. And, and learning is my favorite thing in life. And uh never stops and never you know i never stop looking things up on google or checking them out and on the in the chicago manual style i i love learning and uh this world is a a massive catechism of knowledge that i can't get enough of it and uh, i'm very proud of the fact that i my curiosity has never dimmed We are kindred spirits, my friend. I cannot get enough of learning. Uh, yeah. Ken so Atchity, much. thank you so much for being on Awakened Nation. I really appreciate your time, my friend. Thanks, Brad. It's been a pleasure, and I uh, hope to see you again. Keep up the good work. You bet. Hey, everybody. Uh, tune in next week. We're going to have another great guest here on Awakened Nation. Take care. Thank you so much for being a big part of the Awakened Nation movement. This is how you can help me and our extraordinary guests. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please share it out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And let's grow this movement by word of mouth. Our success will be because of you. Thank you, and see you next week.